Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining me. Thanks for coming in. Uh, I know this one's a bit later than my usual live show, but I appreciate you all uh, being here. I've got a guest with me today. I have uh, Shelly from There's No Place Like Home, a YouTube channel which has been in the uh, Millennial Kingdom thought experiment game, shall we call it, for a, a good part, a good few years now, I would say. And uh, people have been asking me nonstop to have a conversation. And, you know, I've, I've been wanting to have this happen for a while myself. And Shelly has kindly accepted and she's with me here now today. So, Shelly, how are we doing? I'm doing really well. How are you? I'm, I'm very good. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, originally your channel actually is a, a homeschooling channel, isn't it? If, if, um, if yes. I'm correct. <laughs> Isn't that funny? <laughs> it is. I imagine that was a strange U-turn for some of your original um, subscribers to suddenly start talking about this uh, this particular topic. How, how was that? Well, you know, I got to the point where I had made so many homeschooling videos and I went down the rabbit hole back in 2017 and I started thinking to myself, well, I've done everything that I really need to do about homeschooling, but if they are, if they are awake to what the public school system is really all about. They should know that we're being lied to. So I'm just going to start educating them on some of these other topics. So my question, the narrative series really just kind of started out to be the basics for beginners, you know, just to let people know what else is out there and the possibility that we're being lied to in a lot of different ways. A lot of people were really receptive to it. Some people still only tune in for my homeschooling videos, but I'm glad they stuck around. And I actually did get a comment a few days ago that said, oh my gosh, Shelly has gone crazy. And I'm like, okay, that's fine. So <laughs> it comes I'm with the territory. With yeah, it comes yeah. with the territory, doesn't it? Um, I mean, I actually, um, I have a, a two-year-old and we're, we're, we want to homeschool him as well and we've been saying this since since he's been born we do not trust the school system at all not even a little bit uh, so I, i'll actually be coming back to your channel to get all that information <laughs> when it comes to it no doubt yeah um so I, i'm glad i've got your channel available there as a resource <laughs> as well as to discuss this interesting topic we're going to get into today so yeah we're here to, we're here today to talk about the millennial reign the millennial kingdom this theory that's been going around to try and explain from a christian perspective this Tartarian theory that came up about five years ago about all this ancient architecture everywhere that seems to have some weird technological ability hidden within it, within the geometry. And um, for a long time, you know, people were going on and on and on saying there's this ancient advanced civilization that was wiped out and we are the reset people who have been taken over and we've just kind of moved in like squatters into these amazing civilizations and history's a lie. The controllers have controlled everything and made a false history for us. And there was this amazing civilization called Tartaria. And then a few Christians thought about this and went... Now, this sounds like the millennial reign more than anything. And, uh, here we are. So uh, you've made some amazing videos on this for, for a long time. And I think you probably got the ball rolling for a lot of people, actually, um, looking at it. And uh, I've only just dipped my toes into this recently in the past month or two. And it's it's been a, a wild ride, to say the least. The, the reactions are insane. Um, so my first question to you, really, um, just to get this talking is, how did you get into this? What 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 triggered this for you exactly? And also, what kind of reactions have you been getting? Just in just in general about that. I'm curious. This is my question. I'm curious as somebody who's dealing with reactions. What are you having to deal with as well? Well, first of all, I started coming across the whole idea of Tartaria from John Levi. I love his his videos. I think that he has a lot of great insight. And he's the one that I specifically started learning about the mud flood. And then the concept of Tartaria came in. Well, shortly after that, I came across a channel called Exploring Tartaria. And that is the first video I ever saw. It was called The Timeline Deception. And that was the first video I ever saw about the short season because I had never even heard of the short season before. And I know that you mentioned that in some of mm. your videos that yeah. a lot of people have never heard of the short season. And I didn't either, which, you know, says a lot. How much attention was I paying when I read Revelation? Obviously not much if I didn't even know what the short season was. And I was blown away by the idea of us being in the short season and the millennial kingdom having already happened. I do have to say, though, that I was troubled by the idea of Tartaria because if you 
you know, just look at the commonalities between Tartaria and the name Tartarus, you know, yeah, that's, yeah. So, so that's why I started thinking, okay, I think there is definitely something to this theory, but I don't know that I would go all in and say Tartaria was the millennial kingdom, you know, not specific. And I know that they will tie it to some people tie Tartaria to the specific nation, whereas other people will use Tartaria as a blanket term for the types of architecture that they see around. So I I've, I've done that. I've used Tartaria just to say the types of architecture but many people have actually tried to use the empire of Tartaria and bring that in and say that was the millennial kingdom. And that's really where they, I kind of, they lose me on that one. Fair enough. I mean, it, it's, it's a hard one to square because a lot of people come to me saying things like, well, the, the architecture you're claiming is millennial reign is just adorned with pagan iconography um, statues of gods and goddesses. And, you know, God wouldn't allow that because obviously no graven image of anything in heaven or on it. You know, it's 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 not it's not God's way to have these kind of things everywhere. But then exploring Tartaria, as you mentioned, try to explain these statues, didn't she, in her videos, where you're saying, are these not maybe representations not of pagan gods or goddesses, but of the perfected saints that would have been around during the Millennial Kingdom who had this freedom and time to create all this amazing artwork and self-portraiture. Because what else were they doing during this glorious kingdom other than having the time to make such frivolous things, shall we say, and, and taking the time to make the buildings beautiful. Uh, so again, I, I, I don't know where I stand exactly on it. I'm like you. I mean, how, how are we supposed to square that, biblically speaking? Because um, again, no graven image type of thing. But then also where it says that, you know, where that commandment's given by God in a way. In a few verses later, it does say, create two cherubs and put them on the ark, you know. So that is God then justifying art is allowed to a certain extent of things in heaven, shall we say. So then the line gets even more blurry and, and strange. And, and again, I, I wouldn't know how, how to... Do you have any ideas on what, what we can do about this? I think that some of the occultic statues and artwork that you will find on these buildings we can actually attribute to possibly happening them adding this during the short season because we see it even nowadays they there are these beautiful buildings and we'll just kind of slap something on it you know whether it would be a sign or whether it would be they they name the building and put that on there so i could certainly see them just adding things to the architecture that was already there i think that is definitely a possibility like you said though i don't know for sure this is just an idea that that I had. Yeah, that's all we can do is not just speculate for now. I don't. We, again, for the listeners, we cannot say anything with one hundred percent certainty with this right. topic. We are just allowing ourselves to speculate and run with the idea because there's there's a lot here that cannot simply be ignored just because we have perhaps as a collective Christianity believed a certain narrative for so long that we are awaiting the return of Jesus and tribulation is about to happen. That's kind of been the mainstream narrative for the most of my life in terms of Christianity. And I'm, I'm sure for yours as well. And mm -hmm. um, like I said, I did make a video recently kind of discussing this concept, didn't I? That, that it seems like there was a revival of the pre-millennialist mindset among the youth who have grown up to run churches today that stick to this strictly Jesus is about to return. We're living through tribulation viewpoint. And it's possible if all history is alive, well, maybe that wasn't the predominant thought prior. Maybe we do need to think it's possible people used to believe it's all history. And it seems like maybe that is the case from some comments I've received. But then I, I've had comments <laughs> since then saying that's wrong. It's always been the case that people have been waiting for Jesus to return. But how do you square Jesus saying, I'm coming back immediately to the people around him and then adding 2000 years to that. I, I, I struggle to understand that because that, that kind of makes him a liar in a way when he was telling people, I will, you will see me in this generation. And people say, well, that was the fig tree generation. It's kind of like, but he's saying it to the person right next to him. You will still be here and you will see me come, you know? And I, again, I struggle with this 2000 years being added on perspective it's easier for me, I think, because I wasn't raised in a church to question that mainstream narrative of Christendom. 
and I think you've said, uh, I was talking earlier, you yourself were born again quite late in life as well. So it's easier for you as well to question the narrative as you do so often in your own show. But uh, what do you what do you think of the, the you know this concept that people have added 2000 years as the mainstream thought? And what, why is it so difficult, do you think, for people to actually let it go, that concept? I think, first of all, when when you hear something your entire life, it becomes a part of who you are. It becomes a part of your faith. And I think that when people hear the idea that we might not possibly be in the tribulation, it might be already passed and Jesus may have already come. The millennial kingdom may have already happened. And they almost seem to lose a sense of who they are as believers. And many people have come to me and said to me, well, where does, where do we stand then? If everything is over with, where, what, what about us? What about believers now? And I tell them we're supposed to spread the gospel just as with before the tribulation, because Jesus will be coming back for the white throne judgment that we still have to look forward to. And I, I think that so many believers, they have kind of blended the millennial kingdom together with the right with the white throne judgment completely through the short season out the window and they don't understand that these are two separate events and there is another event in the middle of them so you can't really put these two events together and i think that's where a lot of the confusion is is coming from because when they think of the return of of jesus just as you mentioned in one of your videos they're expecting to be resurrected and to live and reign with him forever and they don't understand that there is a thousand year period that will end it tells us specifically that it comes to an end and it tells us that satan will released will be released and that he will come out to deceive the nations once more, Gog and Magog. And it specifically says all of these things. But for some reason, Revelation 20 has been completely overlooked by a lot of churches. I think that there may have originally been an agenda behind it because we know that the churches have not always been forthright in information. I'm thinking specifically of the Vatican. We know that they have the vast archives of things that they are hiding in the Vatican. Mm. And if you have this narrative going, I think that it becomes much easier to control people in that way. No, I, I can I yeah. believe that. I mean, that, that alone, I mean, for years, you know, I've been, again, I've been in the conspiracy game for years and we've all known something really, really dodgy is going on with the Catholic church something's off about it why did they have all this information just buried under there in these mile-long vaults that's that's a lot of stuff they've got there to fill miles and miles and miles and it's gonna kind of, we have to we have to wonder like what are they hiding exactly that we're not allowed to see and then obviously exploring tartaria brought this amazing concept up that well maybe the catholic church we see today it's like an echo or a corrupted remnant of the the kingdom's church when Christ came, you know. And what we have today is not that. It's not what it was. Like, it's something else. And they've kind of moved into the empty churches and established this fake satanic little season version of Christendom as the official church, you know, of Christ. Um, but really, these glorious buildings and the saint iconography all over them is a remnant of when the saints did rule with Christ. And it's kind of there's something off about, you know, the Catholic Church that people, like I said, we've been saying for years. And this kind of when I heard that, I was like, this squares a lot. This makes a sense of a lot of what's actually going on with that entity and why it's so suspicious to us. And yeah, again, I, I am not just willing to throw that to one side like there's something going on there. And I'm, an, I'm a non-denominational Christian today. I've never felt comfortable settling for one specific faction as though they have all the answers. You know, I mean, where do you stand on that? Just out of a personal curiosity. I I go to a denominational church but I can't say that they they necessarily would agree with my stance on the short season. I, I agree with much of what my denomination follows. But when it comes to this, I see one of my lights has gone out. But when it comes to this, um, I 
I, I'm very much like you. I think it's very important that instead of worrying what our denominations say, we should worry about what the Bible says. And we should not be discouraged from looking into the Bible for ourselves. Be a Berean. And you asked before about my comments, and this is something that a lot of people have issues with in my comment section, because they cannot get out of this mindset, the pre-trib, now my other light just went out, sorry, terrible timing, but this pre-trib mindset, um, and they, they can't wrap their minds around maybe that they may not live through the tribulation. Maybe they will not be there for the millennial kingdom. And I, I, that's why I think instead of just blindly following what a person tells us, we need to, again, we need to be in the word. And yes, we can look to our pastors and our elders for guidance and for what it is that they, you know, they they understand about scripture. But if you see that they're saying things that maybe don't jibe with what scripture says, then we have to go with what the word says first. Absolutely. Well, yeah, no one's perfect. And I'm, and I'm not saying like any denomination is evil necessarily. I think they all have the yeah. best, you know, the best interest at heart to get the closest to to, Jack, to Christ, to God, and to just to be to follow His word the best they can. But again, some some people I think, you know, are heavily invested in as we were discussing earlier before this, the idea that Christ is about to return, and most of their preaching from the pulpits is centers around that entire idea that we look for the signs of the times right now. You can clearly see in the world it's this time in Revelations. You know, the beast is about to come. The mark of the beast is about to come upon us. Um, you know, they've been following that narrative and that's their preaching. Keep your eyes, you know, Jesus is about to return in his glorious kingdom. We're going to get to reign with him. Oh, some people go down the rapture route, though that's obviously a highly speculative and, and contested idea, you know, and, it's a big war and battle where every, you have all these denominations, but they're all fighting each other over the concept of who gets to reign with Christ. It's all these type of things. It's, what if it's all moot? It's completely irrelevant, you know, and that some people, are, they cannot accept that mainly because they're invested monetarily in it. Their entire church is based on that teaching as well. And that's just something they cannot let go of. But I, I from my comments, what I seem to notice is the main the main objection to me talking about this is that they again they can't let go of the idea that they don't get to reign with Christ. Their entire faith is based on this idea that they get to lord over other people in in a sense, you know, and 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 it upsets them when I say maybe not, maybe that's not the case, and. I have I made the argument this isn't a salvation issue necessarily, but if your entire faith is hinged on the idea that you get to rule for a thousand years with Jesus rather than actually understand that Jesus was who he says he was and that there's a God who loves us. If your faith isn't based on that, but it's based on I get to have this stuff by believing, that's not a strong foundation. No, and I think that they also it makes them feel like they're going to be a part of something special when in fact all of creation is already special. You don't need to be a part of the millennial kingdom. You know, God loves you what the same now that, that he loved the people during the millennial kingdom. And I think that's another thing that we, we live in a very self-centered culture right now. I hate to say it, but it's kind of like me, me, me. What about me? What about me? And I can see some elements of that coming, coming into this. People have specifically said to me, so does that mean that I don't get to be a part of the millennial kingdom? And it's very hard, like you said, to tell them we, we might not. And again, I'm not claiming to have all the answers. I could very well be wrong. But this is what I have been seeing as I've been studying this, you know, looking at the scriptures and in fact, just looking at what we see with our historical narrative and the way that it's been manipulated. Mm -hmm. On that, how many, how many years do you think has been added then? Um, I know that they usually say a thousand years. I've been thinking possibly more from seven to 800 years just because, and the only reason that I have to say this, and I'm going to come right out and say this, is because I, I firmly believe that the millennial kingdom began in 70 AD. So if you add 1,000 years for the millennial kingdom, you get 1,070. 
Um, so if you add 700 years to that, it takes you to 1700. And this is give or take. I'm, I'm just rounding off here. But I know a lot of people believe that the Revolutionary War period, 1776, was the time that the short season began. So that would that would certainly end up there. I also know that many people believe the short season actually ended in the 1800s. And if you would add 800 years to the year 1070, that would take you to around 1870 or, you know, give or take 1860, mm -hmm. whatever. And I, I think that that seems to make more sense than the thousand years. Now it could be the thousand years, but if that is the case, then we are at the tail end of the millennial kingdom right now. And the short season hasn't even started yet. If you're following the thousand years from 70 AD. Mm -hmm. And with the things that we see going on around us, I can't see that being part of the millennial kingdom. No, absolutely not. I mean, there's, there is evidence in architecture and in, even in coins that they've changed dates. And it's hard to tell exactly where they did that or how they did it. But a lot of ones were added in front of things where they weren't originally or you know, to make it 18 something rather than 800 and something or um, J's were interpreted as ones or I's were interpreted as ones which is obviously Aesos in Greek or Jesus uh, the year of our Lord is what they were going for instead you know if you want to interpret it that way but uh, Noel Hadley from the Unexpected Cosmology I'm not, I'm not sure if you've heard of him yes I have yeah, um, I'm going to get a talk with him soon about this as well, because he does a lot of amazing work actually showing there are historical evidences for the millennial reign that we do. Because people always say, where's the documents? Why didn't anybody write this down? They did. And he's got it all and he's been showing it all. It's, it's incredible. But he talks about the year for 541 as the worst year on record. OK, and that implies that might actually not be 541 as the history has written it down. It could be 70 AD. You know, that's that's when that really all went down. But we just say it was in 500, 541. And, you know, there was plagues that wiped out two thirds of the population. The sun went black for months. Everything went horribly wrong. Tribulation. Corruption that caused that. Yeah. The, the sun. Yeah. Everything yes. went terribly wrong during that time, and he kept going on and on and on for a good three years, seven years perhaps. You know, it went on for a while, and um, yes. people did document it. You know, and and it's just that people don't want to say that that was seventy AD and perhaps you know what tribulation occurring, and it might be written from the perspective of people who, first of all, are trying to cover it up because they know what's going on, but they know how history works. They're like, we can't let people in the future know this has happened. Agendas are at play here, you know, and Satan has a plan. He's kind of like, okay, so I've got my agents, just as he has today. I need you to fake the history now. So when people uncover yes. it, we can start picking up from where I left off when I come back. Yes, All that there needs must to be, be a foundation. Yeah, exactly. You know, and I think yeah. they were playing their games. And he talks about how they had the propagandists of the day who were making this stuff up, you know, and, and ignoring things. He says there were people around during that time who were purposefully telling people this isn't tribulation no 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 this is this and they use the science you know to say no no of course it's not all this and the people are around going are you crazy this is clearly god angry this is it <laughs> like and they were like no 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 even while it was happening they were gaslighting them and saying no no that's not what's going on here no no trust trust me <laughs> and it's and yeah. everyone's like no th this is it you know so but they're the ones who wrote yeah. things down they're the ones who documented things and it's funnily enough it's their histories that got remembered and picked up and carried on in the future you know because they probably had people to preserve it in the right places vaults for example underground as we just talked about earlier you know and anyway noel's done some amazing work on that but again he puts the date to 541 but that wouldn't square mm -hmm. with jesus saying you know you'll see me in your lifetime so that's again right. so we have to remove 400 years 470 years from that first of all you know so where mm -hmm. do we begin with the timeline deception because it's the chronology is all over the place. It's everywhere. I mean, yes. um, one of my um, subscribers actually went a mod for me, MK Ryan. He asked me to ask and bring this up, the idea that there was the, um, an event in, I think it was Nuremberg, and this huge display in the sky of, of orbs and lights was happening above this, what looks like a millennial kingdom city because it's full of spires and churches in all the paintings and drawings. But it looked like a war in heaven was occurring. Giant spears were appearing, all sorts of crazy stuff, you know, and that was documented in the 1500s. But again, if we talk about the timeline, what if that was actually 70 AD? And another thing that people have mentioned as well, which kind of ties all this in is, 
for some reason, the medieval period, they all seem to paint and draw Jesus as though he was dressed like one of them. As though he was living in a time where they lived, not in like Middle Eastern robes in sand. No, he was around all these amazing churches. He was, um, and, and all the stuff that's happened in the Bible when he's going around healing people, that was happening, according to the medieval painters and drawers, in cities that looked like their cities, these European cities, these amazing, you know, when they were in clothes that were typically medieval for the day. It's like, and then th th to try to justify this, historians say, oh, they just had a weird concept of time in that period. They, they believed everything was happening in their time period, even if it was the past. And they always, and it's kind of like, no, people are not that, give people some credit. We're not that crazy, you know? So I see evidences everywhere personally. Um, but I, there's a regular comment I get, you know, it's like, there's no evidence, it's not doc documented anywhere. Yeah, and you know, what you were talking about with the years, it reminds me of something that a friend of mine, Donita Fogelman, who she has, she's on the Prairie Dust channel, she has brought up to me the, the wars, all of the wars that we think of with the Revolutionary War, there's the Civil War, there's the War of 1812, the, the, um, the the French Revolution, just like all of these wars, she said, what if these happened either at the same time or much closer together than what they tell us in the historical narrative? And what if this was the very beginning of the short season? Mm. So I think that we really need to take the years that they give us, we really need to take them with a grain of salt because they can tell us anything. And like you said, if they have someone propagandizing or just kind of writing a, a foundation so that other people can then build upon it, but they use that as the core, you know, bit of knowledge that they have about that, you're, you're going to start with a lie and the lie is just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger anyway. Mm -hmm. I see the same thing happening. I always think to myself, these, these buildings that they give the weird, uh, not description, just they they tell us they they give us a really weird narrative of how these buildings were built and you know, oh it was built in two years and then it burned to the ground and then they re rebuilt it using the exact same things and I always think how how is it that they would have all these different stories for all of these buildings and I thought to myself unless they actually did have people who specifically were involved in just writing the foundational framework for all of these buildings that all of this is just kind of built upon. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it wouldn't surprise me in the slightest because Satan is the father of lies. So, of course, he's going to recruit people to do that. Yeah. And so we, we we need to be very careful about and it, it, it's kind of sad because you get to the point where you're like, what, what can I believe it, it, when it comes to the secular past? What can I believe? Not much. <laughs> I'm, fi no. I'm finding. I mean, this this also this theory actually makes a lot more sense of secret societies like the freemasons and even that name is freemasonry it's free real estate they just kind of yeah. took over and claimed ownership oh we built these it was us we built them you know we are the yeah. builders of all these things oh we built america we laid all the foundations of america you know and they do claim that you know and you can see freemasonic symbols as they call them in in the map of like new york let's say in any geographical location it's kind of well what if they were just the agents put in place to create the new narrative for the new world order which is what we are currently already living in because they're always talking about a new world order in these conspiracy circles it's coming they want to build a new world order well what what if this is it what if they built it we're living in the new world order the little season and they, they run it. It's a pyramid scheme, you know? It just answers so much. It puts, it shifts perspectives of everything so much. And yeah. I, I think, I think one issue people have, and this is a question I've got quite a lot. Well, not a question. It's just a, a flat out statement of defeat. I get quite a lot. They say to me, well, if this is the little season, we've got big problems. Have you heard that one? Um, I don't think I've heard that specific one, actually, which surprises <laughs> me because I've heard you talking about your other comments and that one is new to me. Yeah, so no. I don't even know how I would respond to that. It's, because it's, as you mentioned before, how, how different is the short season actually going to be from the tribulation? Like, it's kind of like a more yeah. longer drawn out version of it in, in a way. Yes. And I think that's what people are upset about. They're kind of like, well, what's the point then? 
what's the hope and this yeah. is where i'm leading on to the next kind of uh, topic we, we should discuss yeah. together is if this is the little season who are we as who are we as believers or as a people who are the humans currently living during this time exactly because we're not the resurrected oh saints. where are we descended from do you mean yeah, well yeah who oh. are we are we yeah because it says in revelations once the thousand years is over the rest of the dead are resurrected <laughs> now there's a there's a mm -hmm. discussion to have here when at the beginning of the short season or the end of the short season just before the white throne judgment is the resurrection occurring we're not really made clear you can make any assumption mm -hmm. there as to what happened. And also, yeah. if that's the case, or if we are the resurrected, how does that work? Is it just the initial people who turn up or the resurrected? And then we are the descendants of the resurrected? Or if that's not the case, the, your theory alternatively, which I liked as well, was, well, there may have been people who lived through the millennial reign who weren't perfected people. They were ruled over by saints, but they were mm -hmm. still humans like us. And once the millennial reign ended, they were still around, and then they had lots of children around, and it seems like something happened where the, the parents were removed, children were just left behind, and they were raised to take over this new little season populated, and maybe were the descendants of those children. But uh, what, do, what, do you, what do you think about this concept? Because yeah, I know you made a great video about it, just, just, trying to, just trying to hash it out. I mean, have you made any more conclusions? I'll let you go with this one. My conclusions are. I have no conclusions right now. I still am battling it out in my mind because as soon as I think that I have come up with one coherent theory, something gets in the way and I'm like, wait, but that doesn't fit. So I think that there are many options. And like you just mentioned, I think that we could very well be the descendants of those who lived through the millennial kingdom and were, were still alive when it was over and the short season began. Could be their descendants. We could if the people who were resurrected, the rest of the dead, if they were resurrected right after the, the the thousand years were ended, my thought was maybe they directly went to the camp of the saints. It doesn't tell us that though. And you know, and I don't, you know, and I don't want to speak from something that's not, it's very hard. There are a lot of assumptions that we have to make about this. So if we weren't, if they did not go to the camp of the saints, the rest of the dead, were they then resurrected like Lazarus and those who were resurrected in the time of, you know, that Christ was here and he was, you know, the, the great commission and everything. So I'm assuming that Lazarus then went on to live and then died again. So then I'm thinking, could it be possible then they would, did not have their glorified bodies yet at that time because the white throne judgment had not happened. So could they then have had children? So could we be the descendants of the rest of the dead. I think that it's possible. The one thing that does keep me from that is, and I actually mark this in my Bible, and I'd like to get your opinion on this one. Sure. But it's Hebrews 9.27, and it says, and just as each person is destined to die once, and after that comes judgment. That's what is keeping me because I understand when it comes to Lazarus and the, the other people in the new Testament who were resurrected, those were miracles, but I'm assuming that the rest of the dead after the thousand years were ended would be a very large number of people. So what happens to that verse where, you know, we, man is destined to die once or some, some translations say man is appointed to die once and after that judgment that's where i'm i'm kind of like okay how can i reconcile this with that theory yeah there's a there's a many facets to that really which again I, it's one of those things i also I, i'm i'm trying to figure out uh the, mm -hmm. the the one which people have want well someone said to me recently which again i don't hold much stock in but this is just one idea someone said to me a lot of people argue that we shouldn't listen to what paul says he's a liar I've heard that yeah. one. Now, again, I'm not yes. willing to just throw Paul out completely just because right. some people have that idea about the idea. I think Paul spoke in a way which is very difficult to understand because he spoke very highly of the spiritual nature of things. And it's, you know, so I think it's hard. And I'm not just going to throw him out. All right. Just because, but that's right. one, one idea. And I, I have to bring right. it up because we have to speculate all ideas because mm -hmm. um, in the Bible, Lazarus was raised from the dead. He right. died. 
and was brought back. And you can argue, well, it wasn't really dead. But no, everyone said his body stunk. He was dead. Yeah. He was dead, dead. You know, he was gone. Yeah. But then Jesus said, no, no, they're sleeping. They're not dead. So now we need to ask the question, what what's the definition of death then? When it says that we're appointed True. to die once, what does that mean? Are, we, are those who don't know Christ already dead, spiritually speaking, before being born again and saved? Are we talking about those type of those dead people who can be born again while alive in the flesh, but then also die again and then resurrect it at the end? It's like, what is the definition of who are we talking about in terms of death here then? And what's dead yeah. by the biblical standards? Because is it the, the, the soul dying? Because when we die, we go to Sheol, or that's the case. That's, yeah. where Jesus, that's where Jesus went after his death and resurrection. He went down with, and took the keys. <laughs> and open mm -hmm. and, and release the saints that were already dead in Christ, you know, from Sheol. And when Christ, you know, it says people rose from the dead when he resurrected and, and, and you know, it all happened. And, and it seems like the book of the whole book of the Bible is about resurrection. Now, not reincarnation. Yes. This is where people get upset. No. They try and argue. Um, the reincarnation isn't real because that's not biblical reincarnation is, is bad that's that's the evil religions of the world believe in reincarnation we cannot believe in reincarnation it's kind of well i'm, I'm not saying reincarnation i'm i'm saying you know resurrection i'm not saying coming back as another being or entity that isn't you fundamentally you as a soul i'm talking about you coming back and living once more in in a physical body but you were you were never truly you were never truly dead your body was dead, but your soul wasn't dead. You were sleeping in that sense. So, again, where do we define death here? This is this is how we can probably square this option. I think when they say, you know, we're appointed to die once and then resurrection, maybe that has more, more to do with not the physical death. Maybe it's something but the else. Spiritual. Maybe, yeah. maybe. I don't know. Maybe, maybe that was a reference to the lake of fire, perhaps. If mm -hmm. you want to be, a, you know... A, see that as an annihilationism it's not an eternal torment it's instant annihilation wiped out and then a new heaven and earth uh, and maybe then everyone is resurrected in the new heaven and earth and purified how there's many theories on how we can interpret this to, to square it and that do you have any ideas because these are just some things i've kind of played with you know, you know what you just said really makes a lot of sense because i'm starting to think okay i wonder if they were if they were referring to spiritual death and i don't believe that spiritual death would happen until after the white throne judgment so you've actually given me something to think about now so yeah yeah it's because at that point i was just like i don't and i thought okay well were they using this verse to try to combat the other religions who were around at that time who were saying that reincarnation was a real thing and i thought okay well is that just um a defense saying that reincarnation is not real but I, I don't, it doesn't say that, you know, and there's no, if you look at context, they're not talking about other religions at all in that passage. No. So I don't think that's what it is. So yes, what you said about the spiritual death, that really does make a lot of sense to me now. Yeah. I mean, again, I, not, I'm not final on that. Right. I mean, to make right. That clear. Oh, I know. I know. Just something to think about. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. I, I don't, I don't know. I think, I th and no. this, is, this is another thing I think a lot of Christians need to kind of get to grips with. There are some things we cannot know. We are not God. We do not. I think some. I think reality and existence is extremely complicated and psychedelic beyond our comprehension. Okay, I, mm -hmm. and I think it's it's huge. I don't know how to say it, but it's it's to be full of hubris to think that we can understand the nature yes. of reality on God's level. Okay, and how things work, especially when it comes to death. You know, and, it's very and, prideful. Yeah. Yeah, and, and this is why I, I'm willing to, I'm open to interpretation. I'm not willing to settle on this particular issue on what it means to die and, and how that works in terms of resurrection and stuff. I mean, because I, I had this idea, you know, what if, and this is another idea I think uh, Exploring Tartaria had on this resurrection idea, the, the second resurrection, the rest of the dead, as it's described. Well, that semantic wise that could be explained because if you if it's the rest of the dead so de pure definition dead spiritually speaking and physically okay are resurrected for the second resurrection then what they're talking about those who were truly spiritually dead before christ was even around who couldn't have been saved they're resurrected for the second resurrection so maybe that's who we are maybe we are 
souls coming back into the world who never had a chance to be alive, truly, spiritually speaking. Never mind just physically speaking, because Christ wasn't there yet. The Saviour hadn't come. And maybe where those people lived before, if you thought about that concept. Well, I'm just I'm just sitting here thinking if they were spiritually dead, though, can you be spiritually dead while you're in Sheol? That, yeah, it's, it's a question. You no, know, it's just a question. It's a good question. You know, that's, yeah. that's what I thought of, you know, is because if we are just asleep in Sheol, can you be spiritually dead at that point? Again, like you said, I don't know. It, it's just something to think about also. Well, maybe I'm not sure because when 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 Jesus went down and didn't he did he not preach to those who had followed the law who were he in did. Sheol? And and so he had and he so he had, you know, he he paid for our sins at that point. Yeah. So it, I think it is possible that then after his crucifixion that, yes, maybe maybe they could have been. I'm just thinking, does spiritual death come? Did it come right after his crucifixion or does it come after the white throne judgment? I'm, you know, I'm not sure. I, I, yeah. I, I don't know. Again, it's not yeah. made clear, is it? We just, yeah. we just know at some yeah. point after the thousand years, there's this second resurrection. Yeah. And that would make sense of a repopulation event to oh, fill yeah, the world, definitely. you know. And I think that's I, kind and of that's why, why I'm thinking kind of physical death, maybe. That's what I, I, but see you, you, it's your fault. <laughs> I, was, <laughs> I didn't think of the spiritual death thing before. But yeah, no, but when they're the rest of the dead who who came back to life after in, in Revelation 20, after a thousand years were ended, I, I still, yeah, they, they still came back to life. And I believe that they were the people who died mm-hmm. before, you know, Jesus came, who didn't have the chance to accept the gift of salvation. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's that's like something completely different for me to think about now. The only thing, the only reason I think the second resurrection happened Okay, why I more so think perhaps it happened immediately after the thousand years. Yeah. Just to be clear there what I'm saying, you know. Yeah. Um, it's because at the white throne judgment it says, you know, earth is earth is thrown into the lake of fire. So mm-hmm. that tells me there won't be people on the earth when that gets destroyed. Okay? Right. So that tells me that right. the the great white throne judgment is right in front of the throne of God in heaven. Yes. So the yeah, yeah, and that's that's actually something that I did change my opinion on a bit because I, I kind of went back to the idea. Okay. I, I do believe that they, the rest of the day came back to life right after the short season, because it, you would think, wouldn't it have said the rest of the day came back to life after the short season or, and not only that um, many people, and I always value the, the comments that people leave. Well, most of them um, because they, they really do bring a lot of, ideas and one of them said but does it actually specifically say at the white throne judgment that they are resurrected at that time it doesn't say that it says that they stand before the throne Mm -hmm. but it it, so it says living and dead so it does not say at that point that the dead are resurrected at Mm -hmm. the white throne judgment so that's what really got me to think okay i'm i'm kind of back to right after the the thousand years are ended for them to have been resurrected but i was i was just kind of getting confused from the hebrews verse which you yeah i have a new perspective on that now yeah because again i imagine if if there is this war event at the end of the little season the camp of saints mm-hmm. is surrounded people think that means literally an army has marched up to surround something mm-hmm. specific and we theorize the center of the earth which would be the north pole from a geographical mm-hmm. location but I was thinking from from a perspective situation, you wouldn't you wouldn't have to consider it. It's surrounded as long as the whole earth, other than that one location, starts believing in Satan's plan and follows his system. Then the camp of saints is surrounded by its enemies. Then there wouldn't have to be a a, a knowledgeable idea of okay, we are all specifically going to go to war right now with to to a place. You know, you wouldn't have to think about it that way. It's literally once everybody's aligned to the let's call it the beast system, shall we say? Let's call it Satan's system. Then the camp of saints, by definition, is now surrounded, and then fire comes down, which would destroy everything, all life, other than 
those who are already perfected in the camp of saints because they don't have to die the second time they don't have the second the remnant yes yeah, that would be the last remnant there that's, yeah that's interesting because i only ever thought of surrounding the camp of the saints when it comes to military strategy mm -hmm. but you're right that would also be surrounding and that would make a lot of sense but too would, the, would there then be let's say a transfiguration of those saints and christ into heaven so they don't have to die again. They just go to heaven because they're already in this state where they can just kind of do that in in a way I cannot fathom or understand, obviously, beyond me. I'm not a saint. <laughs> but, but then the rest of the dead are now dead, physically dead, and now in front of right. the white throne in spiritual form, in soul form. And that's how I can right. kind of explain it as, as a process. They're resurrected physically first after the millennial reign, the rest of the dead. Mm -hmm. They live out through the little season and they have a chance to know Christ now because... It's everywhere. You can know who Jesus is in this life now. You know, you might not see him physically, yes. but we can know the word, his story and what he offered us. And we can make a choice now. Then once that time period's over where everyone's made a choice, maybe perhaps through constant souls cycling back in, in, in a resurrection form. I don't know. Again, I, I can't say biblically that's what's going on, but it need, we need to explain, for example, aborted babies. They never got their chance in their second mm -hmm. resurrection then maybe that's why that's happening. Maybe it's to delay the little season ending. Maybe it doesn't end until every single soul has had a chance to make a choice. So the soul, which, will, which, you know, what do you think? Yeah. Oh, no, just you talking about the aborted babies. It kind of then made me think of the incubator babies and where yeah. they came from. You know, that's just something that popped into my head. Yeah. But I, I think that, yes, aborted babies, even miscarried babies, mm -hmm. you know, they they would it would seem that they would all be given the chance the free will yeah to accept Jesus or not but i, I think so. there was there was a quote in uh, i can't remember the book now someone sent it to me i think it, it was either it might have been no was it daniel i don't know but it was talking about when uh, joshua basically went against god's edict and didn't do what he needed to do to take the lands back and he wasn't allowed to go into the lands because of it but he said mm -hmm. the children who don't know good and evil they can that was God's judgment. He didn't judge the children who don't yet understand a concept of good right. and evil. Children get a free pass is what that passage was saying. God's perspective is yes. on the matter. So then that could even square the whole aborted baby thing. Well, if that soul was, you know, grew up to be a, an infant, but then was killed, it's okay. They get to go through, you know, but, yes. uh, you know, so, but then obviously that, maybe that's an answer to that the aborted baby yes. but then also i do feel like god would want every man and woman to be able to make the free will choice you know i think that's another big deal about god's not one of those people interferes with people's decisions he lets you right. make your own choice you know and I, I feel like i'm not trying to say reincarnation but i'm saying the soul gets to come back in until it's old enough to make the conscious choice and maybe that's what the little season's about it's never defined how long a little season is it, it you know they don't they don't tell you how long that is and i think that's because it's not in, it's 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 until it's done you know i think jesus may it may be called a little season because jesus no it won't take long so i don't i don't know well <laughs> i said a lot there what do you think of those ideas of you because there's a cabbage patch baby thing as well isn't there which yes the, the cabbage patch babies and then the incubator babies and you're like okay where did they come from and, you know, I, I did a video on that. And I think that's the one where the woman said, oh, my gosh, Shelly's gone crazy. <laughs> but it's just like, you know, it's just you have to think, what does all of this mean? Where could these babies have come from? And that's only one um, that's only one answer for where they possibly could have come from. I also think about when it comes to the short season is that even though it says little season in the Bible, we have to think that if you look at the, our, our time period here, you know, we're, we're just a blip. So what seems like a long time to us is not a long time to God. So, you know, and I, I hate to try to put lengths of time and everything on things that are not specified in the Bible. But one theory that I've had is, well, if you are basing the little season on the thousand years, there are four seasons in a year. So would the short season be around 250 years? I don't know. And again, a lot of people are saying, well, that's a long time for a little season. Yes, to us, mm -hmm. it's, it's a long time. But, you know, not not to God. And I, you know, I think that we need to stop. And this is another one of my friend Donita's sayings. We need to stop putting God in a box 
and thinking that he can only look at things f- from our perspective. And even when it comes to the Cabbage Patch Babies, you know, a lot of people are like, th- th- this is insane to to think that that this could possibly happen. You know, why why have you gone off the deep end with so many of these topics that you talk about? But look at the stuff in the Bible. You know, Jonah is swallowed by a fish mm-hmm. and then, you know, regurgitated onto the shore. We have a talking donkey in the Bible. So there are so many God. God is outside. Not only is he outside of time, but his ways are not our ways. And so I think that we get so used to just doing, seeing things from human perspective that we don't understand that God doesn't always have to do things in the way that he thinks he's going to, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Yeah. I've never been one to set dates because um, even before the little season thing, there's always, there's always been this subgroup of truthers who have always set the day and say, it's going to happen on this day. And people, yeah. people do give up their entire life based on some of these predictions people make. And yes. the day always comes and passes and nothing ever happens. And then you're always drawn to that yes. quote, aren't you? It's like, no man knows the day or the hour. Well, right. they would, But that was talking about the second coming of Jesus. Now we have to reinterpret that as well. It's like, well, I think the whole point of that phrase, no man knows the day or the hour, is what you were saying. Our ways are not God's ways. Our perspective on time is vastly different to his view of the holistic image of creation. You know, it's... And we cannot understand that because that logic as well that people go off, you know, like you mentioned that I've heard it a lot. It's like, okay, so a thousand years divided by four, 250 years because of the seasons. So the little season has to be 250 years, but that's arbitrary to, to make that assumption based on that math, because think how long existence of creation is. So let's say 7,000 years. Well, what's 7,000 mm-hmm. divided by four? I mean, are those periods of roughly about 2,200 years? So yeah. is a little season by that definition of going by quarters of time spans, 2000 something years. <laughs> is that a little yeah, season? And, our, and, our, <laughs> and I, I would love to be able to read it directly from the Greek, because what do they mean by season? Are they specifically meaning season or do they just mean like a, a vague general period of time? Mm-hmm. You know, and that's something else uh, we you know, I think that it's important that we read the Bible for what it says. But I think that sometimes, depending on the translations, if you if you can't read it from the original Hebrew or the original Greek or Aramaic, you know, we're we're taking we're at the mercy of the translation. Mm-hmm. So sometimes we we see something we think, OK, season means we think of winter, spring, summer, fall and how long they are. But, yeah. you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that that's what they mean by season. It could just mean a period of time. We Absolutely. don't know how long, you know. Absolutely. Sorry, I'm just going to turn on this light here. Hopefully. Of course, yeah. <laughs> there we go. Sorry, I'm like, this is so dark. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a game of semantics where we have to be careful. Um, but in terms of like, language is pretty clear in the Bible sometimes, though. Like, the problem is with Revelation, you can be interpreted with a lot of this. People, Some people say yes. it's completely symbolic. Some people say, no, it's half symbol, half truth. And But then this is where we have our issues, isn't it? This is where our interpretive issues come from. But, yeah. you know, we do have direct quotes from the Gospels, from Jesus himself, where, for example, where he says something like, and he said unto them, verily I say unto you, they, there shall be some of them that stand here, which shall not taste death till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. How, yes. is, how are we supposed to reinterpret that symbolically? <laughs> I'm at the point now where I'm just, no, he was talking to the people who were standing there with him. Yeah. And I, I'm fairly certain about that now. Mm-hmm. As for you know how to even interpret Revelation, I have, I I came across a series of videos. I don't know if the man if the man who does them is a partial preterist maybe, but he has a great Revelation series. And what he was saying, the way that Revelation was written, is that it was written for the people of that time, and they would have understood exactly what they were talking about in Revelation. Because if you look at us, think of the, the the political um, cartoons and things that we use. People of today understand what it means because we're living during this time. And that's exactly how the people of that time period would have read Revelation. They would have understood it. And the reason it was written that way was because it was written for them. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was really interesting. Well, we know it was written for them specifically because it even says here in Revelations 22.10, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy in this book, for the time is at hand. That's basically saying, yes. 
John, go and tell everybody what you just learned. <laughs> like, yes, like it's, immediately. It's, Get out there now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's for them. Go. Yeah. Like, and never mind that. I mean, revelation. I mean, these this is this is Jesus giving the revelation to John. This is Jesus' words mm-hmm. at the end of it. That's how we should understand it, you know. Uh, okay, Revelations 22, 7, 12, 26, and 10, if people are wondering, okay? And even Revelations 1, 3, and 7 all say this. Behold, I come quickly. And behold, I come quickly. Surely I come quickly. Must shortly be done. The things which, which must shortly come to pass. The time is at hand. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. They also which pierced him. Mm-hmm. How how are you supposed to reinterpret that as symbolic? I have <laughs> had people tell me that what that means is just the descendants of those people. And I'm like, well, I, I don't know. But what, everything that you just listed, they, they he could not have been more clear about the immediacy, the imminence of this. Yet, yes, people will change it, even when it comes to, I was it Revelation 1-1, where he said that these things must happen quickly? And I went to a Bible study at a church that I used to go to, and I remember at the Bible study, they said, well, quickly doesn't mean quickly. Quickly just means that once it starts happening, it's going to then, then it will be happen in a quick manner. And I was so confused, and I was still a baby Christian at this point, and I was like, okay, I'm just going to take their word for it. Mm-hmm. But he actually goes over this in that Revelation series. He he goes over the the actual Greek meaning of what the word quickly is. And it does not mean, you know, whenever it starts, it will happen quick. It means like right, very, very soon. That's what mm-hmm. it means. Absolutely. Yeah. I, again, I mean, one of the main arguments that I always get, obviously, the, the fallback argument is we can't possibly be living in the tribulations because we are seeing Sorry, uh, sorry, the little season, because we are seeing tribulation happen now. Okay. Mm-hmm. And, and my my go-to argument is, okay, well, if it is the little season and Satan controls everything, including the media, um, everything you see, you know, and hear with your senses if, through that respect, you know, and has every resource at his disposal and all the money, wealth, and power, and an army of people physically to do his bidding through these secret societies and th- you know, through all this type of thing, do you think maybe they could perhaps make it look like tribulation was happening? That's my go-to, re- that's my go-to response. Yes. I mean, what? how do you deal with that one? What's your go-to yes. response? I, I, have, I have said that also, and another thing that I tie in there is Ecclesiastes, where it tells us there is nothing new under the sun. What has been is going to happen again. And history is cyclical. And the Bible tells us this. And very often history is cyclical because man continues to do the same things over and over again. Mm -hmm. So, yes, I think that it's very possible that a a tribulation-like era is being orchestrated, you know, intentionally orchestrated to Mm -hmm. deceive because, again, who is Satan? He is the father of lies. And Revelation 12, 9 tells us that he sets out to deceive the whole world. Mm-hmm. That's that's what he wants to do. That's his goal is to deceive everyone. And so I don't even know that it's any one specific thing. I think he wants to deceive people about everything because when you question everything around you, what are you, what are you going to question, especially a Christian? They're going to start questioning, well, then how do we know the Bible is re- Israel? Mm -hmm. and that a lot of people have asked me that how do we know then if everything around us is a lie how do we know the bible is real and my response to that has been if the creator of the universe was wanted to take it upon himself to write what i would call a letter to us a love letter to us instructions for living i believe that he would see to it that it was given to us in the form that he wants us to have it and in fact even if you have satan behind everything around us being corrupted, he wouldn't even have to change the Bible because all he would need to do is get people to question it. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't need to specifically change it himself. No. So, yeah. Well, he he would create a structure in his world which makes it seem like believing in the Bible is primitive and crazy and stupid. And also, he wouldn't have to get rid of it because all he has to do is just convince the Christians living in his time 
that they're living in the wrong time. That's all yeah. you have to do, you know, which would cause people to lose faith when things don't necessarily go how it was planned out in tribulations. Especially with the rapture, you know, that's something that that that's worrisome. You know, how many people will lose their faith if they see things that they specifically think are from the book of Revelations, but no rapture happened? Hmm. How many people will lose their faith because of that? Sadly, too many, because, again, it's a poor foundation for your faith to think that you don't have to suffer. Yeah. Like, yes. You know, that's that's not what we're supposed to. We're not supposed to follow Jesus and believe in God so we get to not feel pain and be and and get whisked away when things go south. That's not the point of it. We don't do it so yes. we get so we get stuff. We do it because it's truth. Yes. That's why we that's the point. You know, we we don't do yes. it for anything. We do it because it is the truth. That's all it comes down to and to walk in the truth yes. is not easy. It's it's a pick up your cross, carry it, <laughs> you know, it's suffer you're going to suffer unfortunately that's just, just the way it is and that, again I, the whole rapture deception is, is a is a it's a sneaky one as well as, you is. know yeah it is and and was that was also a lot of really strange doctrines came about in the 1800s which mm -hmm. leads you back to okay could that be when the short season began because a lot of these strange doctrines also began in the 1800s mm -hmm. so it's just something else to to ponder <laughs> absolutely well speaking of uh, there was a topic you wanted to talk about today and we're kind of on that now because we're talking about tribulation yes. I'll, I'll leave it to you to do your little presentation on this one go ahead <laughs> <laughs> i don't know that it's a presentation but i was watching your video earlier the millennial kingdom q a hmm. and the first question that someone asked was about the mark of the beast and i had been browsing through a preterist website called revelations in grace and what I actually found was that they have what seems to me to be a very good explanation of the mark of the beast happening around 70 AD. And it was during the time of Nero. And so what this said is that the mark of the beast actually has a spiritual and a physical component. So there are two components to the mark of the beast. And we know that much of scripture is like that. There are more than one meanings. You know, there's there even with prophecy, there are more than one meanings. So spiritually, what the mark of the beast was, was loyalty to Rome and allegiance to the beast. Physically, during that time period, there were Roman coins and deeds with Caesar's image, and they forced the Jews of that time to use those things to buy and sell, which went against the law in Exodus and Deuteronomy, which has no graven images. And you had brought that up earlier about the graven images. Another interesting thing, um, do I want to bring that up now? Let me just think. Well, I'm just going to bring this up now because in Deuteronomy, another very interesting thing in Deuteronomy 6, verse 8, it says, tie them to your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminder. So this concept of the hand and the forehead does not happen only in Revelation. It happens several times where it is mentioned in the Old Testament and what the what that means is it is symbolic of giving an allegiance to are you do you, are you giving your allegiance to God who who are you following who are you worshiping mm -hmm. and that's really what it means is that the specific hand and forehead thing it doesn't mean like a chip in the hand or some kind of tattoo on the forehead or whatever you think it specifically it has was used multiple times in the old testament and it just means whoever you are giving your allegiance to um, another thing was when when the people worshipped Nero, and this is back to the physical aspect of it, the people who worshipped Nero were given a certificate or a mark of approval. And the word mark is the same word that was used in Revelation 13, 16. And I'm probably going to butcher this, but it's charagma, C-H-A-R-A-G-M-A. It, it means mark, and it is the same word. So the, the mark of approval that people who worship Nero were given is the same word that is used when it comes to the mark of the beast. So 
as soon as I saw them ask that, I'm like, I, I know this. I don't know it off the top of my head, but I knew where I could find an answer for it. I'm not going to say the answer, but I'm going to say a possible answer, a possible explanation for this. That's a great, it's definitely squares. It, it can fit now with that narrative that we know that Nero did this. It can yes. work that 70 AD was the time when it began. It's, it's a good mm -hmm. answer. It's a brilliant answer. Thanks for sharing. I appreciate it. Now I have an answer to share when people ask me as well. So I appreciate that. That's wonderful. Sure. Um, sure. I hope you guys in the chat enjoyed that too. That, that's, what, that's what we're here for. Um, so <laughs> another one, again, which we always, we always hear in terms of you know, tribulation coming to pass, the mark of the beast, like you brought up there, you know, they're always pushing propaganda in Hollywood that it can be any, many, many things, the mark of the beast, you know, um, a chip is the most common one. We have to use it to buy and sell. And I feel like they're, they're always, they're always playing it. There's always a new mark of the beast. First, it was barcodes, you know, then, then, then it was chips. You know what I mean? Then it was the contactless payment and all this type of stuff. And it just, it kind of, it's always, the goalpost always moves in our time because I don't, I don't believe we're going to see a, a, a true tribulation come to pass in our time. If it is the little season, we're going to see, echoes of it happening symbolically in the media or in certain things and there'll always be those people who will stir everyone up and say see see the signs are happening jesus is about to return and i do think the repeated set the date because the signs are here date comes and passes jesus doesn't come back is to crush faith that's the point is to keep destroying that faith because people well they don't know where they are so they don't know where we're actually going so they're always going to be disappointed and it's, it is it is sad to see. But then another one that always gets brought up and maybe I don't know if we can even talk about this one, but a, a particular state was made after World War Two, which people point to being prophecy being fully fulfilled as a specific people all came together, and moved back into this land when that happened. I would argue again, because this is another one I get all the time. They can orchestrate that. And it does say those who say they are blank but are not they are of the synagogue of satan that has been made clear yes. many times and I, I, that's a big one to say though that's a hard one to say in, yeah. this, in this particular climate especially right now so i'm just it it is yeah. one thing that i will add without adding too much is that um the word nation when it when it comes to what you are talking about Nation is the, the word that is used is not referring to a geographical location. No. It is referring to a people. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a very important distinction that people need to make because a lot of the people who, who follow that idea, they, they are looking at it as a geographical location when that's not what that word means. Absolutely. That's, I agree. I could not agree more with yes. that statement, but I think that's yes. all we're probably allowed to say on that, on this particular yes. platform. So let's, let's yeah. move on. I saw an yeah. interesting one today. There's a, I think the channel's called Homesteader 7 or something like that. He's He's been in mm -hmm. this Millennial Kingdom game for a while. He's been making videos. He he actually, actually, his following is is criminally low. He only has like 1,000 people on his channel, but he's been doing this for years, talking about the Millennial Kingdom. And he was talking about, you know, Independence Day. Americans Independence Day, which we celebrate every year in the, on the 4th of July, um, is actually, again, getting people, Christians, no less, <laughs> Christian nations who celebrate yearly the millennial reign ending, which I thought was a really interesting. Wow. Now, so I'm actually, I was born on the 4th of July. It's irrelevant to me because I'm in England, <laughs> but <laughs> so, but I do, I do, I know, I, I, I get that concept and I just, I think that that was an interesting idea as well. And I think also, they also brought up this great thing that you might not have heard of, but um, the song, I think, is it Joy to the World? The Right? The, yes. They, they read it out and it says, this doesn't sound like it was talking about the birth of Christ. It sounds like they were singing about Christ coming to reign and rule and now joy to the world, you know, and, and yes. I, th I thought that was it to say that's a remnant left over from the millennial reign that we still sing today sort of thing. I don't know if just thought I'd share that yes. with you as an interesting con Have you heard any other little tidbits I, like that? Yes, I have. I, I've seen it about joy to the world and also the song, the saints go marching on. I don't know all of the lyrics, but the first verse says, mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Mm. So have seen. So as if it's in past tense. Yeah. And it's, and it, and it is it, the whole song really does sound like it's talking about the coming of, of Jesus. Mm -hmm. So that is another one. But there was another one besides joy to the world and the saints go marching on. And I cannot remember off the top of my head, 
what it is. But there are several songs like that that have you scratching like before i didn't think anything of it i'm just like oh that's just weird grammatical usage like joy to the lord the joy to the world the lord is come and i'm thinking okay that doesn't it's just bad grammar or maybe it's just because it's older and i'm not used to it and now i look at it in a completely different way so that's what we have to do now because again this this, and it it could be like people say where's the evidence where's the evidence we would know if christ had reigned for a thousand years i hear it all the time it's kind of like well actually my pastor has said that it's like actually i think there's a lot we're just uncovering it now we're just realizing it's actually always been right in front of us the evidences and it's kind of yeah and little bits like this just keep appearing it's like here's here's a bit more here's a bit more and maybe this maybe this is god in a way moving and making people actually see something now i don't i don't know maybe this is just a theory removing the scales from our eyes i i don't know but you know i think that if people aren't aware of the deception in our history then it is very easy for them to think that it could have that that there's no way that we wouldn't know this Mm -hmm. but so the very first step in realizing it is you you've got to realize that the history we were taught was wrong yeah it it just was and that just brings down the entire house of cards. So it does. that's that's the first step. You've once you, if you if you are going to continue to trust the mainstream narrative, then there's no way that you will believe that it could have been covered up. But those of us in the know, we know that it very well could have been covered yeah. up. What if has what if it is the case that because it's been a it's been one mess of a like half a decade the last five years alone have been chaos for humanity especially with that thing that happened which locked everything down you know but i think yeah from that particular event i've i've noticed there's been a revival or a, an insurgence of people who have begun to go what happened there we, yeah. were, we were lied to you know and I, I think there's a lot of people who have suddenly just began to question everything because of this particular event I get a lot of people in my Telegram group coming to me saying, you know, I, I, I woke up after that event, you know, and, it, and then I started going down the rabbit holes and here I am. Um, and I've not seen a wave like that in a long time. I've been doing this for over a decade, you know, and the, I, can't, I can't even think of the last time there's been such a, sur- a surge of people suddenly just realizing women lie to. <laughs> there's people who control us. <laughs> like These people are evil, you know. They've suddenly just had that horrible moment of waking up and and seeing the world for what it actually is you know the they live moment they put the glasses on finally you know and could that be because more people have now suddenly lost faith in that system and started looking towards god for answers are we being given them i i believe that when it comes to that what satan uses for evil god will use for good Hmm. so all of these people were stuck in their houses they didn't have anything better to do than to watch YouTube. Absolutely. And, yeah. you know, so they start scrolling and they, and yes, they're already now questioning things because they see all the insanity around them. So they're going to gravitate more towards those types of videos. So absolutely. Yes. I actually also noticed it was around 2016, 2017 too. That was when I kind of went down the rabbit hole and I've talked to many, many people who all said 2017 was the key year for them as well. And so I know that YouTube and, you know, social media and everything has been around much longer than 2017. But I think that was, you know, uh, people started making it their own and were coming out and making more content and everything. And I truly believe that the the, the internet and everything it was it was created for control purposes but we the people have turned around and we have used it in ways that they never intended it i think that it we kind of threw it for a loop and that is yet another one of those examples where satan meant something for evil and god used it for good i mean yeah. people people argue don't they well this is tribulation because people are going to and fro and knowledge is increasing, which is the internet, people would say. And that's only just happened now. But as you said, there's nothing new under the sun. It's possible. All and this tribulation stuff- is just a word that means trouble. Like yeah. that's all that it means. So it doesn't, you know, you're not going to have only one period of tribulation. Now, yes, they're referring to the great tribulation, mm-hmm. the one specifically mm-hmm. spoken of. But the word tribulation just means trouble. And yes, there are going to be periods of tribulation throughout history. And there will continue to be periods of tribulation. 
until until Jesus returns for the white throne judgment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the, another thing about well, this this whole. First of all, it's kind of written, so it's going to have to go the way it goes in, in Revelations. It's, and it's kind mm -hmm. of unav it's unavoidable. I would like it if there wasn't this horrible war with involving Gog and Magog, whoever they may be in the future. Um, but something is going to happen. I mean, maybe the, the whole idea that the, the short season was never defined is because we can stop it from ending that way as long as we continue to have these moments of revelation and, and not not stop it delay it i guess is what i'm saying and um, because the whole point like, like i said trying to trying to make it so good can come out of it is save as many souls as possible before the little season ends that's the point isn't yes. it you know and I, I am wondering if that again if for, for the for the controllers it's kind of two step forwards one step back for them and we're always trying to push them that extra step back so they can't get that final plan finished in a way i don't know i don't know it's a, it's a, it's a I'm getting very speculative with this one now. Uh, <laughs> I don't, yeah, like I don't, much yeah. of it is speculation, but you know, you were yeah. re asking earlier about the controllers and just the motive that they would have for recreating the the tribulation mm -hmm. events and everything. And you know, one thing that I thought of was, look what's happening. You have people arguing with one another, Christians arguing with one another, one another over the the tribulation and whether it's happening now or how it's going to happen. Is it literal? Is it, is it, you know, figurative? And so that creating division between us is a huge help for them, mm -hmm. you know? So of course they're going to want us to be divided against one another so that they can, you know, use more of their tactics against us. Absolutely. And I think, unfortunately, it works beautifully because human nature, you know, we just we we like to fight with one another, even people that we definitely as believers, we should not be battling back and forth with with one another the way that we do. But that is that is one great reason that they would want to recreate this, because they know better than anyone how we are. They just they know they're playing on our pride. They know people want people want to know that they are right. It's their way, yeah. the highway, and that's what many Christians are arguing over about. No, my interpretation's correct, not yours. Okay, and yes, that's, it's not yes. really the point. That was never the point of following Christ to no. have have the correct way of worshiping Him. <laughs> you know what I mean? I think yes. he offered a gift. Take it. You know, yes. it's as simple as that. His yoke is easy. Don't overcomplicate the gospel, which I find that's yes. what a lot of these people are are definitely doing today in, in a scary, upsetting way. Um, it is. And, you know, you mentioned the you asked me about my comments and how people in the comments are. And one of the things that I've noticed is that people are very, very adamant that they are 100 percent correct in their interpretation of it. And. I think that that says one of two things about them. It, it's saying that they're very prideful, or it could also say that they haven't actually looked into it too deeply. Because what I found is that no matter what interpretation you come through, you can find something in the Bible that will seem to refute it. Mm -hmm. So it's just one of those things. That's why I refuse to say, okay, that's it. I figured it out. I, I have all the answers. I'm never going to say that. Because I know that that time is not going to come. And I think we need to be careful of that because I'm sorry, but if you are not the Lord, you're not going to be 100% correct, at least when it comes to this topic. You know, mm -hmm. the, the, the gospel, yes, you can be 100% correct about that. But when it comes to things like the tribulation and with end times and with the millennial kingdom and with short season, there are a lot of gray areas. So to come forward and just, I've actually had people, yeah, they, they get irritated with me because I won't say one way or the other what I believe. And it's like, that's because I don't know one way or another what I believe. I pray all the time for discernment, you know, saying, Lord, please grant me discernment. I don't want to mislead people. And that's why I think it's very, very important that we just say, these are things that I'm looking into, but I don't know for sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
sorry, the uh, denominational dogma. I think my sound went out there. Sorry about that, guys. Um, yeah, I'm back now. But the point I was trying to make there is, you know, you're allowed to talk about these things, and that's why we do these talks. That's why I do these talks to, to try and show we can discuss these. It's okay. Don't worry too much about the dogma of your denomination. We're free to do these things. I think God created us in His image not to be docile servants who don't question anything. I think that's an insult to God, to be honest. I think he made us in his image because he is the creator of the universe and we have the ability to think. We are creative people. We, that's what we are. You know, We are like him. We're not God, but we are in, in his image. We can think. We're allowed to think. He's not going to chastise you for thinking and just yes. que questioning the narratives that are placed in front of you in the world. That's the point. You know, these are worldly narratives that have been kind of laid out by men who run corrupt institutions that they call the way of Christ. You know, you, but you can't trust man. Man's fallible. They give into pride and money. So this is why we have to think. You know? and it's yes. I'm, I'm trying to show it's OK to think, especially with very contentious topics like this, because this is. Probably the biggest, most contentious thing in Christendom today, I would say, because no one's ever really been on such a mass scale discussing these topics. And it's growing. There are more people than ever talking about this topic now. It's it's mm -hmm. getting it's snowballing now, I think, because yes. it. I've said in my recent video, a lot of Christians don't even know, as you mentioned at the start, that there even is a part of the Bible that discusses this. They don't know about Revelations 20. And the end part of it, where it says mm -hmm. the season ends and there's a short season where the devil rules. They don't know. Like I said, they've mashed it into one timeline and they've, yes. they make it as though everything happens all at once when Christ returns and that's it. Everything's done and dusted then full stop. No more. And that's not what it yes. says. That's not what it says, but that's, that's the, the teaching today. And it's as someone who didn't go to, doesn't go to church and wasn't raised in the church. It's shocking to me to know that that's what, the dominant thought was you know because all i did was read the book say what the book said and people started hating me <laughs> and, they're, and really coming at me as though what i've just said is is the worst possible thing to ever say and it's blasphemy at the highest order heretic, oh, and heretic uh, yeah, heretical radical. yeah and i'm like it's just what the book says you know i can't yeah, just reading the bible <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I, I noticed that, you know, when you said about how they combined the two into one thing, I noticed that even on both sides of the church, you know, I grew up in a church that many people nowadays would be would consider to be a very liberal church. I grew up going to a Lutheran church, which is very it's, it's very much like the Catholic church. Um, and, you know, my parents, they would kind of just drop me off there. They it was important that I go for tradition's sake, but they didn't really go to church unless it was Christmas Eve. <laughs> but um, I remember, though, in the sermons that every time that the pastor would talk about the coming, the second coming of Christ, he would be talking what I now know to be the white throne judgment. I never heard of the millennial kingdom or the short season. I never heard of the thousand years. The entire time growing up at that church. And I went to that church until I was about 29. So never heard of it. I only it was it was kind of all mashed together. He's gonna come again. They didn't they didn't even really talk about the tribute the tribulation, to be honest. They just talked about the second coming, and that was then we were all gonna be judged, and that would be the end of it. But then on the other hand, when I started going to an evangelical church, the focus was on the millennial kingdom, on the tribulation and the millennial kingdom. But they kind of left out the white throne judgment. As you mentioned before, it was like the millennial kingdom and then the white throne judgment are kind of all together. Because once once Jesus comes back, we're all going to rule with him forever and ever. Amen. You know, and that was it. So even though they're two very different, the, the churches are coming from very two different, very, I can't speak, two very different perspectives. They're still mishmashing the two of them together. And there's there's no separation, and neither one of them ever said a single word about the short season. Mm, yeah, because it was naive of me to come at it originally, thinking, "Oh, everyone must know about this." Yeah. <laughs> and then I'm like, "Oh, that's not the case." Okay, never mind. Let's back up. Let's back up a little bit. But uh, no, I, yes. I, I can't leave this topic just to one side because it seems to upset people. I, I, it's it's too big. It's too important. And again, may, maybe. Perspective is what matters here, because, again, I, I, I have a foundation of conspiratorial thinking. 
I've been examining the control all over the world <laughs> for a while and trying to figure out what's this all about? Why? Yeah. <laughs> you know? And I knew it had a lot to do with Christ. I always knew that. It's all to do with whatever happened here with Jesus, you know, which is why I'm a Christian, you know. But this just feels like a missing piece. This sorts the timeline yes. out, you know, this makes sense of the motives. Because that's another question, never mind Melania Rain. A question I would always get as a conspiracy theorist is, why would they do this? Who has the time to do that? What do they have to gain from controlling us? You know, and it's kind of, that's a big question. It's, it needs a big answer, you know, and this is a big answer, really. This is a... Yes. But even to get people just to recognize this answer requires them to have a lot of context. to li It's a big deception. It's a very hard deception to get out of. And again, ev everyone's kind of fallen for it in their own way while all believing they have the truth, Christians included. And yeah. isn't that just how the devil would work? You know, isn't that? You know, and I think it's, uh, uh, you know, the whole mud flood idea that grew really popular, didn't it? There seemed to be a, a, a great reset event of some kind in maybe the 1800s where everything got buried in mud. And mm -hmm. again, I think you get, said, no, Tartaria just doesn't cut it. That doesn't make sense. But uh, perhaps a really, really pissed off Satan being released would make sense of that. A, a, giant, a, big, enough, a big enough earthquake to uh, melt, the mud, melt, melt the ground and sink some buildings a little bit might make sense of that, you know? <laughs> Um, I mean, I I don't know. What is the predominant Tartarian thinking of why the mud flood happened? Do they have an answer? From what I've heard, predominantly, it's maybe that the controllers, um, maybe the technology went too far mm. and became too hard to control. And so it was important to kind of set everyone back again, you know, kind of back at back to square one. I haven't heard much talk about motives when it comes to that. And and maybe maybe there is talk of motives now. I haven't been following the Tartaria stuff very much anymore. Mm. I did at first. I haven't been. So that they could now. But motives never came about. Much of it, though, was just because they, they had reached a level where it was just too hard to control them. And they kind of needed to knock everyone down. Think of they likened it to the Tower of Babel. You right. know, where right. everyone worked together to build that tower so that they can get up there and make war with God. And God's like, nope, this isn't happening. Dispersed everyone. They all started back to square one. And it almost started like a Tower of Babel type reset, so to speak, hmm. you know. Because that's that's kind of the, the their perspective. It's it's always a great reset every few hundred or thousand years or so. That's how they square it. And that's how they make sense of the destruction of of the earth and these buildings. All these buildings are just remnants of older civilizations. Um. Uh, an argument I always get as well is, oh, these buildings, these Tartarian, the Millennial Rain buildings are from Noah's time. And it was the Great Flood that buried mm -hmm. them. And I'm like, well, no, imagine a Great Flood. I'm talking like a deluge that covers everything and the, the forces involved with the pressures of that water, torrents of water. Even these buildings wouldn't have survived that. No chance. No I think chance. that when it comes to some of the architecture, some of the uh, megalithic architecture, some of that could have been pre-flood. And yeah. if you, you know, do look at some of the megalithic structures that you see that are buried really deep under the ground, you'll see a lot of these photos from Egypt and everything. Some of them that were buried really deep, I think they could have been pre-flood. Yeah. But if you're looking at, at these, these buildings that have half buried windows, and I know that they were, you know, dug out. You're right. I don't think they would have withstood the pressure, let alone the water damage. And, you know, they I don't know if they I believe that they probably had more advanced technology than what we do, because mm. I believe that the evolutionary theory has kind of taught us that people are getting smarter over time. But I think we're kind of getting dumber over mm. time. Um, but, yeah, I think the the megalithic pre-flood, the as for the Tartarian Tartarian architecture, yeah, I think that that would definitely have been after the the flood. Yeah, that's that's what I try and say. I try, I try to explain the megaliths, the big ones with the huge stones that we just could not lift at all, and it's, it boggles the mind to see these these enormous rocks and structures. Well, they actually look like they've been through a flood. They are battered, extremely weathered, and incredibly underground because they were just sunk and gone. Yes, but these Tartarian Tartarian buildings you have to use that word yeah. um 
Yeah, they're only like a couple of feet inconven minorly inconvenienced. <laughs> like just a little a little bit of mud has buried them maybe a couple of feet or a few feet or maybe a meter or two at most, you know, and the windows are now peeking up above a little bit. And it's like that's that's if that's the flood of God, that was a that was a that wasn't very good. <laughs> you know, that was yeah. a poor attempt yeah. at a global deluge, you know, is what the way I see it. Um, yeah. And even then, you can actually see weathering on the on these Millennial Kingdom Tartarian buildings. They've been through a weathering, like rain and basic weather. They're not mm -hmm. perfect now. They have right. to, they have decayed a little bit. You know what I mean? And I don't think they would have survived thousands of years, but they do show signs of hundreds of years of weathering. You know, yes. so it fits into the relatively new, but still older than what we have we've been told you know that's that fits the narrative well but this this idea that oh it was the flood of noah because they want to try and say these buildings are evil so they must be from a pre-flood civilization where the nephilim were everywhere and these the nephilim <laughs> built these buildings and I, could it not just be as simple as they were defaced after the millennial kingdom and yeah satanic imagery was just added to it Doesn't of that, course does that make more sense than thousands of years past? And yeah. I, I don't, I don't, um, yeah, it's just, that's a, that's a common one I get. I just wonder if you have any thoughts on that idea yourself. I start yeah, bring it up. I, no, I, I completely agree with you because, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we, we do that nowadays. We'll, we'll just kind of slap our stuff onto other buildings that are already there. You know, I was watching, I think it was my lunch break where he showed that there was this old building that they, they say was built specifically for one of the world's fairs. Um, and they kind of just put a plaque on it with, with its, with its name, or there are other places that might put a sign or they might change the statue. Sometimes you see, they actually, like you mentioned before, they deface them. There's something on the, the building that they don't want people to see. So they will actually scrape it off or mm -hmm. cut it off. Like they kind of cut the noses off of sphinxes and stuff. Yeah. So, you know, and they do that to these buildings too. So I think that that is definitely more likely than those specific buildings, sitting through the the flood and even if you look at the architecture i know a completely different topic and i won't stay on it long but like the pyramids i believe are pre-flood and if you actually look at it they many people believe that they were supposed to symbolize uh mountains and the sacred mountain theory is actually very prevalent in um the ancient hebrew uh worldview and so it and also in the old uh Nephilim religion that they were trying to come about at, at antediluvian times. Uh, and it would have made sense that they were trying to build some sort of cosmic mountain. That's the word, not, not mythic or whatever I said is cosmic mountain mm -hmm. because that was something that was in their religion. So it, yeah, yeah to me, that says definitely pre-flood for the pyramids at the very least. Mm -hmm. And we also know that the, Again, different topic, but we know that the giants were larger before the flood than after the flood, so it would have been easier for them to build those <laughs> megalithic structures. Oh yeah, I, I say it's like it's like playing with yeah. Lego. It's like playing with Lego to them. It's nothing. Yeah, like it would have been yeah. very easy. It's an afternoon's worth of work, to be honest. It's probably not much. Yeah, to them. Uh, yeah. yeah but I agree with you. De the, those are definitely pre-flood remnants, and we there's plenty underwater still pyramids. You know that. Oh yeah. Never, never resurfaced. You know, and I absolutely believe, yeah, that's the case. So I've got to, We've actually hit most of the talking points I had laid out for us today, just here and there, scattered okay. through them. The only thing I can see on here that we've maybe not touched on is, and it's a big question. So where are they now? Where's the saints? The saints? Where's Where's Jesus gone? What What's What What happened? <laughs> like, where are they? Why can't we see them? What's going on? What What's your predominant theory on on that? that concept and then we'll go have a back and forth see what we've got i used to think that they possibly just ascended after the the end of the thousand years but then that was before i actually started thinking about the camp of the saints mm -hmm. so i think that there could very likely be a physical camp of the saints here on the earth and recently i've been delving into the possibility that it's at the north pole <laughs> just because there are so many different reasons first you have um, well, I believe in what we call biblical cosmology because people don't like the term flat earth, but I, I believe that, you know, there is an actual firmament over us and that the, the Aurora Borealis could vary that, that you see at the North pole. And yes, it does go out. You do see some of it at the South pole, well, Antarctica as well. But what the colors that you're seeing up there, they 
actually are the exact same colors as what Revelation describes as the throne of God. Mm -hmm. And the Bible tells us that the earth is his footstool. So if you think about that idea that God's throne is directly above the North Pole, and then you have the idea of the, the saints possibly being there. And I, there are many stories of the, the North Pole actually being warmer than what we're told. There's uh, an article from the 17th, 18th century that actually described some sailors who were saying that they sailed up to the North Pole. It was very cold at first. They reached an area that was very temperate. It was actually warmer than Norway. And at one point, the sun became so hot that it melted the, the tar or the pitch on the ships. So you have that idea going on. So many people believe that's also where the original Garden of Eden possibly could have been too. And wouldn't it make sense that the camp of the saints would be at the original Garden of Eden? Because the Garden of Eden is how God originally wanted things to be before the fall. And so I think that would be the perfect place, in my humble opinion, for the camp of the saints to be and also possibly for the New Jerusalem to descend on one day. I don't know. That's what I'm thinking right now. My idea is the North Pole. But again, that's just speculation. I agree. I, th I think um, it would make sense for God to choose a central location to bring his his beloved city to. Um, so mm -hmm. people can make the pilgrimage to see him during his reign in a fair in a fair manner. Everyone has the <laughs> everyone knows where it is. Just follow your compass go north mm -hmm. you know it's it's not hard to find just keep making your way up there and you know you, you talk about the how that the climate there's evidences to say it actually gets warmer the closer you get to the north pole once you get past that ice ring that cold mm -hmm. patch it starts to get warmer again and um yeah you've just been reading the smoky god book haven't you i believe yes um which is yes. a fiction but mm -hmm. it seems to be echoing the same thought or pattern or idea that there's this warm temperate climate and a kingdom there full of giant ish type people with a yeah. king ruling over them who <laughs> said uh, what do you think of that i remember reading that years ago um mm -hmm. there was a, a youtube channel called flatter flat water um, i remember that one and he used to just read books after books after books like three hour long presentations i used to listen to them all and he read the smoky god and that's where i first heard that and yeah i was blown away by that story because it's like is this real is this a real it sounds like a real account, doesn't it? It sounds like a true story. Like, this is what my dad told me, basically. And he goes off to tell this story, doesn't it? And it's yeah. e considering what we're talking about today, it's just eerie. So what do, you, what do you think of that story? I think that there is definitely some biblical significance to it. I know that it was written, supposedly, by someone who was a follower of Odin. So from a Norse perspective, which I think made it even more interesting, because in the book you have there is a pillar of fire mentioned that and there is also there was a place called Eden. So supposedly they go down through an opening in the North Pole and they enter inside the earth. And there is a vast city where the ruler lives called Eden. Mm. There is another place called Jehu, and Jehu is actually also someone from the Bible. Um, I believe he was a king. I wish I could remember off the top of my head. I'm pretty sure Jehu was a king. And just the, again, yes, as you mentioned, they were giants. And I, there's definitely something to that. The only thing that really bothered me the most is that they were worshipers of this like orange orb hmm. inside of of the earth which could be the pillar of fire maybe mm -hmm. possibly and we know that that's how god presented himself in the exodus so yeah there's i think there's a lot of truth in that book i know it's presented as a fiction but the fact that some pages the footnotes take up more space than the actual text of the story it, it really does tie in a lot of factual information mm -hmm. into it it's, yeah it's an it's like an echo of something isn't it like it the story just lines up too perfectly with this the north pole yes. some, something there and there's a a city an advanced city yes. the people there are perfected in a way and it matches this millennial kingdom thing but again to hear it from a pagan perspective is interesting because again they would call it different things and that's another thing we see throughout history i mean i think 
the millennial kingdom has been described by many cultures around the world, but with, from their perspective, from a not mm-hmm. a not a Christian or a, a follower of the of Jesus in any way, like how they would have interpreted those events from their perspective before they knew the truth. That's the kind of documentation we seem to be finding, and this fiction just yes. echoes that similar meme throughout of cultures all talking about the same thing from their view. Because I mean, I, in my work, I've been writing about the Nephilim, for example. Mm-hmm. And you'll find every culture has encountered them, but they all have a different mm-hmm. name and a different artistic way of describing them and a slightly different tale about how they appeared that's similar, but they put their own spin on it. And it's kind of... Yes. And then people argue they're all different types of creatures, but it's like, no, they're all talking about the same creature just mm-hmm. with their own way of doing it. I think we can possibly see the same thing if we start doing our studies. I, I bet we'll find the same pattern emerge talking about this millennial reign. We'll find different cultures describing it in their own perspective and ways. And that's our evidence. I think we need to start. And again, Noel's been doing this. He's been doing that, mm-hmm. hasn't he? Um, this is going to be a collective effort, I think, to get as much evidence yeah. as we can for this because it's new, it's fresh, you know, and I suppose this is a call to people who are into this now of hearing this, you know, get on board. Yeah. Because I'm not, I'm yeah, not, and, what do I know? <laughs> Go right. ahead, sorry. And it is such a new topic that I, another thing that people in my comments is they want all the answers right now because they have been fed the same narrative in church, you know, the premillennialism, pre-trip stuff. So they, they have what they think are the answers to all of this stuff. And they expect us to be able to like spit all of this information, like right back to them to rebut it. But the thing is, is we haven't even had time really to look into everything yet because it is so new and there are so many different ways to look at it. So many different verses that can mean so many different things that it's almost not fair of them to expect us to be able to come in and immediately answer back you know, or respond to what they have to say about it because they've grown up about that. The church has had how long to create that, you know? And so it's, it's almost like we haven't even have, we've, we've barely scratched the surface on it. I think. We, we're nowhere near. <laughs> we have, we, no. we, we need to keep going and getting deep. The thing is, yeah. the, there are people better, better than me doing so much more deeper work on this. I it, and the stuff I can't even I can't even retain all the information I'm finding from these other people because it's it's too much it's a lot it's like a it's it's a full revisionist perspective of of the past you know and I'm excited I, I don't know I like I'm excited about this this is a fun it's a fun idea again I, I'm not going to like change or live my life based by this thing specifically I think I was already following Jesus doing my best to keep the commandments understanding the free gift of salvation through faith as well doing my best you know and mm-hmm. i think that's all he asked for us just to do that as well this stuff is more like side project stuff I, i'm not going to again i'm not going to date set or define my life by it and all that sort of thing this is something we should just all it's the truth we're uncovering the truth have fun with it at the same time it's yes. kind of what i'm saying you know some people i think have taken things a little bit too to heart too serious and they've lost themselves in these these stories they've told themselves and and one thing i like about this and people again people do say you know there's no hope now because jesus isn't coming back we're doomed it's kind of like no i feel like this gives us more hope because it means yeah. it, it means what we're being shown is a lie on the media and we don't have nothing to fear there's no fear right. anymore you know that's how they control us with fear you know and, and this kind of takes it away from me in in that respect i think it's a hopeful message in, in many ways um because the real end is coming and what comes after this is a new heaven and a new earth and that's infinitely better than the millennial kingdom was because that will be for an eternity exactly and i i think they're they're losing sight of that you know they wanted so badly to be part of the millennial kingdom but they're look they're, they're forgetting the new heaven and new earth infinitely better as wonderful as the millennial kingdom was if it already happened as wonderful as it was New the, the new heavens and the new earth, infinitely better. It was like a taste of things to come, the millennial reign, I feel. I feel like that was yeah. that's what he was trying to show his people. It's like, like, if you can imagine what we've created here on earth, imagine what's in heaven. Imagine, yes. you know, it's that type of thing, isn't it? If it's, if the millennial reign has come on, it's true. Let's just say that as a caveat. Okay, so, yeah. Yeah. but it seems like that's what it was. It was like, um, this is an example, you know, of an of an earthly kingdom compared to a heavenly kingdom you know 
Yeah. Yes. Yes. And I, I think that, um, Another reason that the whole idea of being in the short season gave me additional hope is because you do have all of these verses that you mentioned before of Jesus, you know, saying things as if he's coming soon. He's saying he's coming soon. And so a lot of times you would have atheists coming back at you with that. Well, where is your Jesus? Where Mm -hmm. is he? He said he was going to come soon. He never came, did he? And guess what? He did. (laughs) If this is true. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And so that's like, this is confirmation. It's like, okay, see, we told you, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Because this is the thing. There are so many of these stumbling blocks for Christians, questions like that, which we, we haven't had answers for. And yeah. we've had to rely on faith that the answer will come eventually. And I feel like it, the answers are coming hard now. Listen to them. Like Satan has de- truly deceived people for a long time. Like, we have been so lost. We, we don't even know when we are, never mind who we are. <laughs> like, And I feel I feel like God is countering that now. He's like, no, the people will know. It's time. It's yeah. time. It's time for them to know. Okay, this is the truth. This is what's really going on. And I, I feel like this is why there's such a visceral gut reaction from a lot of people when they hear this of denial. It's because it strikes such a deep chord with them very quickly. And when people react like that to things, it's because of cognitive dissonance. It's because they know this makes sense, but I don't want it to make sense. Yes. I think that's the issue, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Right. Well. I, and I, I kind of I kind of had that reaction too when I watched the first Exploring Tartaria. Even though I thought this is really cool, it kind of didn't sit right with me at first. It was almost like it was too good to be true. Mm-hmm. Because I had that hope that, wow, he he was already came back just like he said he was going to. Mm-hmm. But I think another reason, again, that it didn't sit right with me was just bringing in the whole Tartaria thing with, you know, with it as well. Um, but, yeah, it it was it wasn't something where I was like, oh, well, this makes sense. And then I was like completely on board. It's something that I really had to pray about because I'm like. I don't want to lead people astray. I don't want to talk to this about my children until I know more about this. So it's not something that I immediately dove into it. It took time. And I was honestly afraid to talk about it on my channel for a while. And there are even times that even now I have to take a break from it on my channel because the people who comment, they just, some of them are fantastic, leave really insightful comments, things that I never would have thought of. People sending emails with information, newspaper articles, PDFs fantastic things but other people just go right for the throat you're a heretic Mm -hmm. or this is blasphemous or today i had someone in the community group she said please stop misleading people and i was like how am i misleading people when i've gone over multiple scenarios and have said every time that i could be wrong but you still have people that they don't want to hear it so they will just they'll come at you Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah they usually say don't they what if the devil's tricking you into believing this? Uh, so you take the mark or something like that. And my response is, well, of course I'm not going to take the mark. What do you take me for? I'm not an idiot. <laughs> like, <laughs> why, why, am I, why am I suddenly going to just fall for tribulation and revel- you know, and, and the beast system and this, the mark of the beast? And Why am I just going to suddenly fall for that? Because this theory might be true. <laughs> like, why? <laughs> Give me some yeah. credit. <laughs> I know. And it's like, hey, since, since Ecclesiastes tells us there's nothing new under the sun and we know that history is cyclical, why would we then say, oh, well, it's totally fine to do it now? It's like, no, you always have to still, you know, people will always ask me, what if you're wrong? Then I'm wrong. But, you know, I'm not like you mentioned before, I'm not living my life any different than I would have before. My my faith hasn't changed. I still believe that there is only one way to salvation. And that's what matters. This is kind of just researching what what the Bible says. And I don't believe that there should be any taboo topics for Christians. No. Because what what did Jesus say was the greatest commandment? You are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Your mind is in there. He gave us this brain for a reason. And how can we love the Lord our God with all of our mind if we're only just accepting what other people are telling us and not searching out these truths for ourselves? Mm -hmm. That's my thought. And Jesus said specifically, love one another. Like, yes, he made it very clear. You make sure you love one another, you know, and it's it's funny you you say that quote as well. That's what's on here. Matthew 22, 37. 
love the Lord your God with all your heart <laughs> and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. That's what it says right here. So it's funny you say that because that's yeah. exactly what's behind my head. And that's the point. Yeah. That's the point. And this was a gift, by the way, from um, a subscriber, um, Elizabeth Joyce, an artist. She painted this, drew this amazing beautiful. thing here. It is beautiful. Um, so I'll, yeah. shill for, I'll shill for her quickly while I've got a big audience. Go check out <laughs> Elizabeth Joyce's artwork. She's a really talented artist and they're rare these days because art is a mess but her, her she's still she's still got talent so let's support that while it's still around but yeah, <laughs> yeah. but yeah that, i think that's a good way to to kind of end this conversation we could go on for a, there's so much more we could say shelly thanks yeah. thanks for joining me and sure. uh we'll definitely do this again sometime once we've had some time yeah. to because like we said earlier more revelation about this particular topic is, is going to keep coming to light now because more yeah. eyes and more people are going to start digging. We have more eyes on this now. So I think we'll have much more to talk about in a few months' time or maybe half a year's time. I think a lot more is going to start yeah. coming our way. So we'll definitely yeah. do it again. Uh, you hold on, though. But for everyone else out there, thanks for listening. And uh, check out Shelly's work. All the links are down below for everything that she has and does. All of her links for all her socials. Subscribe to her YouTube channel if you haven't already. Check out her backlog, her playlist to all of her videos on this topic or in the description to this video, but you also put them in the descriptions of all your videos as well. So you can find all her work, all her work very, very easily. Go and check it out. But uh, thanks for listening, guys. And as always, God bless. <laughs>